Hi, I'm Alan Headbloom. Welcome to our show, a place to feel like you belong. Our guest today is a war survivor with humblest roots. Orphaned in Enemy's history, 1968 was a, a big year. The Tet Offensive, you were three years old at the time, and your dad disappeared. Three years later, at age six, your mom was killed in an accident, and all of a sudden, you're orphaned. Tell us about those, the next dozen years of your life. Mm, it's tough, very tough. First of the poor. Absolutely, that is the correct term. <laughs> yeah. So um, you had no shoes? Well, but, uh, I don't remember what happened to shoes. Okay. Uh, and like I said, uh, my, my kid, you know, now, they have all kind of shoes. And uh, they often ask me what is my favorite brand name. I said leather. <laughs> Anything that fits and keeps the ground away from your skin. Yeah. 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 <laughs> My own skin. <laughs> sure. But I want to go back to your childhood because uh, then until age 18, you had this very you know, uncertain uh, existence. And then when you were 18, one day your aunt came to you and she said, come see me. But at nighttime, I can't tell you what it's about. What was that? Yeah. Well, uh, at the time, a lot of Vietnamese trying to get off uh, Vietnam via the boat, you know. So, um, yeah, one day that I got my aunt uh, came by, and uh, I live about, I think, a couple of miles away from, uh, from where she is. And she said, you know, come to my house tonight. Uh, it's a special thing that I want to tell you. Now, at that time, I know something special. I think... I, I think I could predict that, that we are trying to get out of Vietnam. Okay. You know? um, but, uh, you know, uh, at the time, you know, if the, if the news get out, you know, if someone knows that you're trying to get out of Vietnam and if the police know, it's over. So, um, yeah. So this was after uh, South Vietnam had fallen yeah, to the is, communists. This is uh, 80. Okay. 1980. So it had been five years. Five years, yeah. Sure, sure. So you were able to get out that evening? Yep. I uh, would uh, supposed to be 28 people, but end up a 50-something on a tiny, tiny boat. Yeah. We uh, took us a few days to get to um, China, little islands called Hainan. Okay. And then from there, we go to Macau. And from Macau, we go into Hong Kong. Sure. So on the journey, on the voyage, were, was there ever any concern? Because it sounded like the boat was way overloaded with people. Oh, were yeah. you concerned about capsizing? We see that people everywhere. They put it that way. Okay. You know, um, uh, there was, I don't remember, but uh, I got seasick most time. But uh, my cousin told me that uh, there's one wave hits our boat. And we rode on that boat that, that way for almost three hours. Mm, but I remember there was, uh, there was a stop that we uh, stopped, and I see a lot of uh, dead body floating. Mm -hmm. And we know that those are Vietnamese people that uh, got hit by the typhoon a day earlier. Okay. Yeah, so. so just bad timing that they were out in their boats yeah. trying to go to safety, trying to go to freedom. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wrong yep. day, wrong weather. Yeah, wow. and uh, and uh, a lot of people missions, a lot of people you know died along the way. So sure, sure. Um, when you were in Hong Kong, you were in a in a refugee camp, correct? Yes. Yeah. yes. So and you had actually some options. They said, "Oh, would you like to go to Norway? Would you like to go to Canada?" And you kept holding out. Tell me about yep, that. Yeah. Uh, I was living in an orphanage uh, home. Now remember, this is kind of different. Uh, I am older, four years older than my actual 
driver license or whatever. Then your so official age. That's right, that's right. So I went to get to Hong Kong. Uh, I was 17 at the time. You know, 17, I never knew my real age, let's put it that way. Okay. And my kid always making fun of me. But I, dry, uh, um, I know that I'm older than, you know, uh, what I told, you know, because when you had, you're going to get to uh, the refugee camp, this is like a scam for everyone doing, you know. If you're young, if you, everyone telling you that you want to go to, have a chance to go to school, then you have to lower your age because, you know, you can't, you know. So everyone's, almost everyone doing that. Well, my, I, I lowered my, I think, a few age. I didn't know how many, but I told them 1969, you know, that's my age. Later on, I find out that, you know, uh, when I got back to Vietnam, my, 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 my aunt making fun of me, I said, no, uh, you uh, 64, 65, somewhere in there. <laughs> anyway, so going back to that, uh, uh, I was living in an orphanage home in, uh, in Hong Kong, and, uh, and then uh, a lot of people make me offer because we have a lot of, you know, people from Europe coming over to refugee camp and seeking to adopt kids, you know. And I always come up with the first because I'm actually an orphan. The rest of my friends are just kids that uh, uh, still have their mom and dad in Vietnam or whatever. Had, had escaped, but yeah. still had that's right, living that's right, parents. That's right. Sure. So I got offered to settle in Norway, Sweden. And then had to leave school. And then all of a sudden, here you are, and they're because of your what they thought was your age, <laughs> sending you to an American high school. Um, how, uh, how hard was that for you? I, uh, I remember sitting in the algebra class, you know, and I have, a, like I told you, I have a bunch of, no bunch of, I have a few girls, you know, blonde girls, want to sit by me because I think, they think I'm smart because I'm amazing, and lo and behold, I barely know any mathematics. I can't do uh, division in two digits, you know. Okay. You know, because I only have second grade or so, you know, uh, in Vietnam, you know. But they were stereotyping you, oh, sit next to the Asian guy because he can do math. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and um, <laughs> they found out I wasn't good at all. You know? <laughs> oh, move back to the other <laughs> side of the classroom. So what, what really struck me, though, was, was your perseverance to clear. You had some great guidance, some great support from your, your final foster family that yep. really, really worked to nurture you, get you through school, and then you were able to go to college. Yeah, yep. I'd, uh, first of all, I always want to learn. You know, um, I am a vivid reader. I read anything I grab on. And um, uh, so a lot of people, when they, a lot of Vietnamese, when they talk to me, there's no way that I got second grade in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Because, most of it because I read so much, you know, and that helped me out a great deal. And with the determination, I, I like school, that's what it is, you know. You don't have to be really smart, but if you really like school, that's what it, it helped me a great deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. mm -hmm. and, and impressively, you earned first a business degree, and then later uh, a computer degree. And tell about what you do now with, uh, um, with your company, uh, Digital Marketing Solutions. We uh, start out as a web design firm. Then we move on to web application, higher level. Uh, and uh, right now we uh, mostly uh, help customers to create uh, online auctions. So um, most of the, um, Anyone who want to run an online auction, you know, uh, we are the firm that help them out, you know, so. Um, okay. It's been good. Okay. It's been good. So. And you're having fun. Oh, great fun. Yeah, yeah great, great fun. Yeah. Great, great. Um, we have to wrap up in just a minute here, but when we were talking earlier, we were talking about this notion of identity because some immigrants come to a new place and they say, glad to be here. This is America, learning English, and you know what is in the past can leave in the past, and I'm going to be here. But you have a profound sense of history, and even though you're a citizen, and I see your, your proud American flag lapel pin. That's right. Um, I wear it everywhere. But you still have a very special place in your heart for Vietnam. Why is that? Well... I am a vivid reader, 
and I love history, and I read a lot of Vietnamese history, and uh, I'm so proud of it because we went through so much in the last so many years. There's no other country in this planet, I, as far as I know, that have so much. Um, that, you know, we under the rule of Chinese for more than a thousand years. And then we have the French and then the Japanese and whatnot. But still at the end of the day, you know, we still retain our identity as one nation. Kept your language, kept your culture. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I am very proud as an American. And, uh, and, and, and most of all, you know, uh, I, I think the thing that you didn't ask me is I think is what make me so determined and so strong okay. in what I went through um, since the last uh, 30 years or so when I left Vietnam is that I found Jesus when I was in the camp. Okay. You know, and that um, by a uh, American missionary, I don't know his name, I, uh, I only know his name in Andrew, but I don't remember where, but uh, that's where I found God and never looked back. Okay. And that, what, the, all the strength I have and everything I accomplish is all to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you get a chance, actually, we were talking earlier, uh, tomorrow you and your wife are getting on a long plane flight or series of flights and going back to touch base with your roots. So I'm, I'm really pleased that, that you're able to do that. And Thank you. When you come back and we're celebrating the uh, Vietnamese New Year together uh, next month, uh, I'll look forward to hearing more about that. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the uh, community radio and television. You know, and uh, you guys done a great job. Well, thank you, you. You're doing really great things in the community, uh, Philip. So I appreciate that. And again, thanks for, thank thanks for spending some time yep. with us. Thank you. People like you and like this kind of show really make a big difference in the community. I appreciate, appreciate it. So. Appreciate hearing that. So for everyone who's watching back home, please stay tuned because we'll be back shortly with some tips on American English, American culture, and a little humor. How would you react in an emergency? Would you risk your life to help someone in danger? An article in the Wall Street Journal gives us several examples. A gardener in New York State looked up and noticed a confused 81-year-old driver stuck on a railroad crossing near her house. She ran barefoot to the car, pulled the woman out, rolled together down the railroad bank, covering the old woman with her body just moments before a train smashed the automobile. The hero was slightly injured. The old woman was unhurt. Until we encounter that crisis, we won't know if we will step up to the challenge or freeze up and do nothing. Recently, scientists have identified the qualities and attitudes that separates heroes from the rest of us. There was the case of the Brooklyn, New York man who caught a seven-year-old child falling from her apartment window. The force of the child's weight did severe damage to his arm muscles and nerves, requiring months of physical therapy. But in that moment of crisis, his only prayer was to not miss the falling child who was saved without a scratch. Could we have done that, we wonder? The article told of a military officer who refused to leave the side of a soldier who had a grenade embedded in his leg. He stayed with the injured man until the evacuation team could get the soldier to a bomb squad who safely extracted and carried away the explosive. The officer didn't have to accompany the injured man, but he had promised he would stay with him until the explosive was removed. Are we as brave as these heroes? According to psychologists, there are seven questions to gauge yourself by answering on the scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree. 
the higher your score, the more likely it is that you are brave, empathic, hopeful, and coping. All the traits that are required to be heroic in an emergency. Question one, I have tender, concerned feelings for people less fortunate than me. Question two, fear does not keep me from pursuing my goals. Question three, I try to understand my friends better by imagining how things look from their perspective. Question four, despite numerous setbacks, I usually succeed at getting what I want. Question five, fear does not stop me from doing the right thing. Question six, I want to be competent and I believe I can be. And question seven, being truthful is extremely important to me. So, what do you do if you get a low score? Well, don't beat yourself up. Most of us aren't heroes. We'll just have to be content at being good at something else. <laughs>